So if this is true and he's having a debate with an atheist, the atheist is asking him a question, he's saying that that question is worthless because he's an atheist. Does that make sense? No. <laughs> that makes no sense. But if you're having an actual debate, then you should be debating the question they ask, not saying that it's not relevant just because they don't believe. So those of you who are Jehovah Witnesses in the channel will obviously recognize this. This is a tactic that witnesses use against the people that they don't like, which are the non-believers of the Jehovah Witness, the apostates. So they're saying the apostates' opinions don't matter. This is the same semantics that the witnesses use. And uh, I wanted to point that out because whoever showed this to me or wanted me to watch this, you got to be careful with these people. You don't want to leave one cult for another cult. So, and then the last part is obviously him blaming the question itself that's malformed. So, he's telling us actual factual information that the question is actually malformed. So, when they're having their argument or their question about Genesis being, you know, the Big Bang being one and the same, it's a stupid question in his opinion because it's malformed and it's not accurate, right? Well, here's the problem. The atheist is having this argument. It does make this argument with Christians because most Christians don't believe what this guy is telling us. Most Christians believe this and that's not accurate. So the problem isn't with the atheists, it's with the Christian community. And do you like how he tried to push that off onto someone else? Yeah, I, I, I'm just curious, did you guys notice that or did anyone pay attention to that until I pointed it out? Because when you watch Christians like this guy, and they're going to try to blame things on like atheists or some other group, pay very close attention to the logic they use. And then use that logic and see if it's accurate. So I... Hey guys. I just wanted to focus in on this portion of, I believe it's Brandon, ex Jehovah Witness of Arizona. Because when I was waking up, I read a book from Michael Heiser. And it was Michael Heiser that introduced me to Psalms chapter 82. And Psalms chapter 82 became part of the basement, basis of my argument about who is Jehovah that I should obey his voice. If Michael Heiser had not put that scripture in his book and also many other Christian forums at the time talk show hosts had Michael Heiser on their shows and Michael Heiser was trying to backtrack or further explain or put into everybody's preview Psalms chapter 82 so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to read that scripture from the King James Version and I want you to pay attention to what these Bible scholars, these Bible translators have done. Now Psalms chapter 82 becomes an important text because Jesus quotes from it when he you know allegedly walked the earth. So I want to read it and I'm going to point out what the errors and what the problems are. Psalms chapter 82 starts out with a Psalm of, of Asaph. God, now this is capital G, capital O, capital D. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. Lowercase g, O-R-D-S. So now you have capital G-O-D, judging among the small gods. Okay? He asks a question. How long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the fountains of the earth are out of course. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. But ye 
shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, capital G, small O D. Do you see the transformation here? Do you see what these Bible translators have done with the text? They weren't consistent with the capital G, capital O, capital D. See? Because now someone else is writing this, so they're no longer quoting that text. That's why you have the uh, verse 8, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. Inherit? Inherit? Interesting. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read that same text from the Revised Standard Version. Psalm chapter 82. Now this is interesting because now it starts off with capital G, small o, small d. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. The question, how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? I'm going to go dot, dot, dot. Down to verse 6. I say, you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, you shall die like men and fall like any prince. So this is God judging among the gods. I'm going to read that from the New World Trash translation. God, capital G, small O-D. God is stationing himself in the assembly of the Divine One. See how they change that? In the middle of the gods, he judges. Question, how long will you keep on judging with injustice and showing partiality to the wicked themselves? Going down to verse 6, I myself have said, you are gods. And all of you are sons of the Most High. Surely you will die just as men do. And like any one of the princes, you will fall. The problem with this text is, is that presumably Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, is passing judgment among the gods. And part of that judgment is that, and the question is, is how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked themselves. I referred to that baby between David and Bathsheba. God killed that innocent baby. God struck that innocent baby. How is that judging righteously? And how is it a righteous judgment that according to the law of Moses any man or woman caught in adultery had to be stoned to death, but yet David and both Bathsheba escaped that judgment. That's not justly judging. So that right there in itself should help everybody recognize that Yahweh, Jehovah, if you're a Trinitarian Jesus, are unfair judges. And that came from this Michael Heiser, the same guy now that's pulling the same crap in this video as ex-Jehovah Witness of Arizona plainly is pointing out because it's a control mechanism and it's all based on fear and that control mechanism is the Bible itself because the Bible itself says what if you sin against the Holy Spirit that's the unforgivable sin so that relegates every Bible reader to the position of fear without really comprehending that Psalms 82, the Father, the, the most righteous of all gods, is going to put to death all these other minor gods because they have judged unfairly and they have shown favoritism to the wicked. So I want to give my thanks right here to Michael Heiser because had he not written that book and put those scriptures into my mind, I would not have had what I needed to do that video, Who is Jehovah, that I should obey his voice. Okay, the purpose of this video wasn't only to point to what 
uh, ex Jehovah Witness um, of Arizona did in this particular video. There was a video he did a couple of days ago that I'm not going to go in and take a look at that because there was a two commenters, two posters underneath a video that he did about Jehovah's Witnesses that I would like to add my two cents worth to the um, to the comments. See some legitimate complaints about my previous video about me not being fair to Jehovah's Witnesses. So I want to address some of those comments and break them down. I have allowed many Jehovah's Witnesses into my home since I was young to teach them the truth or word of God, but I never mock them or treat them disrespectfully. I would suggest you go and watch this video in full context and get his rebuttal to this comment. The part that I want to focus on is this part. I never mock them or treat them disrespectfully without love. If you have not love, you have nothing. This was presented poorly. P.S. They don't believe in hell. We do. It is much worse than death. Here's that fear that I was talking about. They don't believe in hell. Yeah, it's exactly right. Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe in a tormenting hell, but they do believe in eternal damnation. See, if you don't become a Jehovah Witness and get baptized, you won't survive into the new system. So there's that fear control mechanism. But we do? Who is the we that this poster is referring to? Is it the Calvinist in this community? Is it the Seventh-day Adventist in this community? Is it the Baptists that are in this community? Who is the we? Well, obviously the we believe in a fiery, tormenting hell because they qualify by saying it is much worse than death. Here's that projection of fear. If a person like this, leaving this comment, decides to read the Bible for themselves and say, you know, the Bible does have issues. It does contradict. In their mind, they've sinned against the Holy Spirit. And that's the unforgivable sin. So, to me, in my opinion, my unsolicited opinion, this comment right here is pure, unadulterated bullshit. Because it's all encapsulated with fear. The fear of death, the fear of hell. That's how these people work, because that's the only way in their mind that they think they can make headway is by projecting their fear back onto this audience. Okay, I'm going to go on to the next comment. So the next one is somewhat similar but slightly different. So the individual is saying that I should not generalize all Jehovah Witnesses into one lump sum, that some are bad but the majority are good people and that his family members are good people, and that I, it's not fair for me to generalize them and say this. And then the second part of his argument is that his family members have been tricked, and it's not their fault they're in this occult, and so they're still good people, they're just tricked. Once again, go and watch the entire video so you can hear his explanation or his um, dialogue regarding this comment. But what I want to focus on is this part down here towards the bottom. It says, to view all Jehovah's Witnesses as dangerous and threatening people. Trust me, my elderly mother is a threat to no one but herself. Now, I have to take exception to this. And I'm going to contextualize this from my perspective and my mother. Now, my mother is elderly. She's going to be 80 this, this year. To contextualize my mother as not being a threat, in my opinion, is a deflection. Because if my mother were to find somebody in field service, let's just say for the sake of argument, a woman with three young sons, my mother will start a Bible study with her because perhaps this mother just lost her husband. My mother will have caught her at a vulnerable moment in her life. So this woman that has three young sons agrees to start a Bible study. 
And it ends up being a progressive Bible study to the point to where the woman gets baptized. She is now a sister, but she has three young sons. What do you friends think is going to happen after this woman gets baptized and some elder comes up and starts suggesting, you know, your three sons can progress faster in Jehovah's organization if I could find a brother to study with them individually because they need that one-on-one -on -one training. And then all of a sudden you find out later that one, two, if not all three of them boys have been abused. Okay, now this is another reason why I reject this statement. Let's take a look at the blood issue. Once this woman becomes a baptized witness and one of her children gets into an accident and they need a blood transfusion, what's this woman going to do? She's going to let that child die. My mother is responsible for that. But here's one that hits even closer. My brother still lives in Cottonwood, Arizona. What if my brother gets into an automobile accident and he's in the hospital and the doctors contact my mother or the sheriff's department contacts my mother and say you need to come down to the hospital real quick because your son is in an automobile accident. Now keep in mind my brother never got baptized so my brother still has a conversational relationship with my mother. So let's say my mother goes down to the hospital under that emergency situation and my brother is slowly bleeding out and the doctors say, Mrs. Brooks, we can save your son's life. All we got to do is give him a blood transfusion. And my mother's going to say, wait a minute. If my son dies faithful, according to my mother's belief system, he'll be resurrected in, into paradise. That may not be what my brother's view is. My brother, not being a Jehovah Witness, wouldn't even think twice about getting a blood transfusion to save his life. But my mother, because she's indoctrinated with the Watchtower bullshit, is going to make that decision, and her son, my brother, is going to die. So my mother is really a threat to a whole lot of people besides just herself. And that could happen to anybody who starts a Bible study with Jehovah's Witnesses. So to say that your mother, and trust me, my elderly mother is a threat to no one but herself. I have a family member years ago that my mother started a Bible study with. It was a cousin. And at that time, my cousin's family, who were Catholics, were doing researches on Jehovah's Witnesses and they were trying to inform my cousin who was studying with my mother that Watchtower has a horrific child abuse problem that they're hiding. In fact, it got so bad that my mother's cousins who were Catholic, I take that back, my mother had to get a restraining order against her cousins because of the child abuse in Watchtower. My mother refused to open her eyes to this. Oh, these are just apostate lies. These are just apostate lies. So my cousin got baptized, and we invited her to live with us for a while while she was trying to transition. And then she's the one that married um, an elder here locally. And you know, this cousin who we welcomed in our house for several months during this transition, when we left Watchtower, my wife met her in a local grocery store. And you know, my cousin could not even make eye contact. My mother was responsible for that. So I reject any and all comments that say, my elderly mother is a threat to no one but herself. That is an absolute deflection in what truth is. Every single Jehovah Witness out there who starts a study 
with somebody with the situation that I described early with three young children are putting those children at risk. Wake up, people. For God's sakes, wake up.